You know, in my job as ambassador to Mexico, I have to listen to a lot of speeches. But as far as I can recall, I've only walked out on one of them. And it wasn't because I was offended. Far from it. It was because the speech was so powerful and really felt like a gut punch, and I felt I needed some fresh air. That speech was Rocky Heron's speech about drugs, which he delivered last December at the Mexican Sports Federation. I think poor Rocky was a little bit freaked out when I got up and left in the middle of his presentation, but I think by now he's realized that that was a good thing and not a bad thing. In fact, I thought that Rocky's presentation was so powerful that I wanted our entire Mission Mexico community to have the opportunity to hear it. I was hoping we could do it in person because the enthusiasm and intensity of a live presentation is hard to match over a monitor, but that's obviously not possible during the pandemic. So as the next best thing, I invited Rocky to prepare this virtual presentation to share with all of us who work in Mission Mexico. I appreciate not only that he agreed, but that all of you are also joining us here today. It's no secret that preventing the flow of illegal drugs into our country is one of this mission's top priorities and has been for many years. Mexico is by far the largest source of illegal drugs entering our country. But I think relatively few of us have a real understanding of the actual danger that these drugs pose to our people, especially our youth. And I think that's a big problem because we're never gonna succeed in stemming the flow of illegal drugs unless each and every one of us not only understands the problem, but is passionate about solving it. Frankly, it's one of my pet peeves as ambassador that we in our country aren't doing more to educate our people, especially our youth, about the dangers of drugs. It's kind of become conventional wisdom that educational programs don't move the needle. But the people who say that haven't heard Rocky Heron. I don't see how anyone can hear this presentation and not walk away shaken and disturbed, but also motivated. It's especially important for us as the United States mission in Mexico to understand the danger that we're confronting. We can and must chase the bad guys and try to lock them up, but that alone isn't going to solve the problem because there's always gonna be more bad guys to take their place. Our young people must understand the dangers of drugs, but we can't expect them to do so unless we ourselves understand those dangers. So I think this presentation serves a key professional purpose for each and every one of us who works at Mission Mexico. I also think it serves a key personal purpose because as family members, friends, and citizens, it's up to each of us to pass this message along to others. As a parent, there are few things that worry me more than my children getting caught up in drugs. And let me assure you, that moment of temptation will come for each and every one of our children. But the drugs available now aren't the drugs that were available when we were kids. They're much more lethal. That's why overdose dose deaths have been skyrocketing. This isn't just an abstract concern. If you're a parent, your child will be offered drugs and needs to know how to react and what to say at that precise moment. Don't leave it up to the kid to make a snap decision on the spur of the moment. You know, sometimes I'm asked about what I'd like my legacy to be as ambassador to Mexico. That's a hard question, but I can certainly say this. I'd like to be known as the ambassador who made a difference on the drug issue. And I'm convinced that we're not gonna do that without a serious educational component, which starts right here in our mission. So thank you all for joining us here today and now I'll turn over the floor to my friend and a man I find quite inspiring, Rocky Heron. Thank you. Well, hello, my name is Rocky Heron and I have been a DEA agent for 30 years. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to, to speak to you today. I wanna to thank Ambassador Landau for his very heartfelt and insightful introduction to my work and, and for giving me this opportunity to share my message with the, the mission family in Mexico. Um, I started this job when I was 23, I'm 53. I've spent most of my life uh, seeing the harm that drug abuse causes in individuals, families, communities, schools uh, across the United States and, and around the globe. And I'm, I'm quite tired of seeing all the suffering. 
And as Ambassador Landau stated, we must and we will continue to pursue the drug traffickers. I completely believe in the DEA mission. We're pretty good at what we do. Uh, and we have to keep trying to catch them and put them in jail. But that alone is not going to solve the bigger drug problem. Uh, that involves educating our children and our societies in a much, much more effective way to teach them to not buy the products that the drug traffickers are offering. And, and to convince our youth uh, to not do that, we have to give them the most accurate and updated information that we have possible. So that's my mission, is to bring you up to date uh, with what I know about where we are with drugs. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you my email. Um, I'm very happy to, to hear what you thought about this presentation, what you liked, what you didn't like, and, and even you know, comments on how to make it better, because I need your help to make it better. And as the ambassador also said, uh, we want this to be useful to you in your professional lives, but even more so, we, we hope this is useful to you in, in your personal lives, raising your children, your grandchildren, and, and being a positive influence uh, for those young people around you who, who need it very, very much. So now, uh, welcome to my world, and I'll, I'll start my presentation. So the title of my program is uh, I Choose My Future. And uh, I'm still a street agent for DEA, but most of my time, when I'm able, most of my time I'm spending in schools, educating children, and teaching that simple message. And DEA gave me that little hand sign, um, which has actually proven to be very effective with the kids. And the message is very, very basic. We all, as individuals, make choices that determine our futures. But uh, you'd be surprised how many kids don't think about that when they're making these decisions. They, 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 they think about the decision, but they don't think about the consequences. And I've had the incredible blessing now to give this presentation over 500 times in 15 countries to about 130,000 young people. And I'm optimistic that when, when we get through the pandemic that I can get back out in the communities and talking to the kids. I begin every presentation by taking a moment to touch on the memory of this hero of mine, DEA Special Agent Enrique Kiki Camarena, who was working in Mexico in 1985 and the drug traffickers kidnapped him and tortured him for several days and then they murdered him. And I was graduating high school that year. And uh, what happened to him shocked me, it shocked the country. It began the whole red ribbon movement we have here in the United States. And that was when my dream to, to join the DEA was born. And a short five years later, I was handed a badge and a gun and put to work on the streets of San Diego. And believe it or not, that's what I looked like when I started. I, I added this to the presentations to show the kids that I have in fact been doing this for a very, very long time. I worked the streets of San Diego for eight years. Um, very, very awesome work, seven days a week, chasing the drug traffickers, a ton of fun. Uh, and because I worked hard, I was rewarded with a transfer to our office in Santa Cruz, Bolivia in South America. And I went there for six years and lived in Bolivia and fought the cocaine traffickers with police officers like this excellent group of men that I got to work with. And when I was training to go to Bolivia, I was in Washington and everyone told me that I was going to Bolivia as an American expert to help them solve their drug problem. And that made sense to me that I was going to Bolivia to help them with their problem. But when I got there and they handed me a rifle and said, let's go. And we went out in the jungle looking for these drug laboratories, looking for the landing strips, looking for the drug deposits. And we would set them on fire and pose with our friends and smile and think we were making a difference. I, I learned a lot of things. I grew up very fast. But the most important takeaway that I have from those years, this is not their problem. The cocaine that was being manufactured in that laboratory was destined for the United States which means it's American drug users who paid the money in the United States that made its way down to build that laboratory in the Bolivian jungle. And all that environmental destruction, the corruption, the poverty that we were fighting, the violence we were fighting in Bolivia, at the end of the day, was financed by American drug users. And that impacted me very, very deeply. I've done bigger cases. I've participated in operations that, that belong in movies. And I'm very happy with my career choices. I've never second guessed it. Um, and I'm still active after 30 years. I, I'm here in San Diego working the border with Mexico. And uh, it's a very, very, very active and, and conflicted border. These are large methamphetamine seizures, 80 pounds, maybe 100 pounds in that seizure. Now, 10 years ago, if I were to seize 10 pounds of methamphetamine, that was considered a large seizure. Now we seize 100 pounds and it's, it's nothing. It's just one of the endless stream of seizures that we have because there's so much drug coming up from Mexico. And of course, this makes me quite sad because we seize a small percentage of what comes across. And, the amount that's getting through and that's getting into the American drug users is, is massive. 
And to me, that means there's millions of, of Americans who are paying a lot of money to put this poison into their veins. And those are my daughters. They're now 25, 23, and 20. And they're my motive for everything I do. Uh, I began these presentations for them uh, with their friends. And I've always tried to listen to my daughters to understand the world around them. And it scares me. I worry about them and I worry about your kids. And maybe not gonna surprise you that I'm a patriot. I, I love the United States. I, I'm proud of the job I have and the badge I carry. I'm proud of the oath I took to uphold the constitution. But as proud I am as I am of the country, I'm not blind. And there are many things happening here in the United States, things we're doing to ourselves, things we're doing to other people that make me ashamed of us. Uh, there's a lot of serious problems that we don't seem to be trying too hard to fix. And it doesn't make me proud. And I, I think you can have both emotions. I think you can love your country tremendously. And I think you can also be ashamed of your country and, and work to improve it in the ways that you can. And of course, this is the problem that, that I deal with every day. We're the biggest drug consuming country in the planet. Um, we use more drugs, we smuggle in more drugs, we have more addiction, we have more overdose death uh, than any other country in the world, by far, by far. One of the freest countries in the world, lots of people would love to get the chance to live here and for reasons that I can't quite understand, millions of Americans choose the drug themselves every day. And of course, the DEA is the lead federal law enforcement agency fighting back against this from the law enforcement side. And we also work in over 50 countries around the world. When I'm speaking in the schools, I, I, I have to begin by explaining that even buying drugs causes violence. And, and you'd be surprised how many people here don't understand that. When someone is selling cocaine here in San Diego, um, they meet up with the local uh, drug user who gives them $100, they sell a little bit of cocaine. Well, the drug dealer takes that $100 and buys more cocaine from another drug dealer who buys it from another drug dealer. And in the case of San Diego, eventually that money gets its way down to Tijuana. And it's that money from American drug users which is paying for all the violence in Tijuana. And it makes me quite sad to know that Tijuana was named for the second year in a row, the most violent city on the planet. Not in Iraq, not in Syria, not in Afghanistan. This beautiful neighbor just to the south of San Diego, the most violent city on the planet because of all the drug violence. And that drug violence is paid for by American drug users. But of course, they don't make the cocaine in Tijuana. They have to buy it from somebody else. So that money, that $100 gets sent down to Central America. And the gangs who protect the drug shipments use that money to kill my friends and the police in Central America every day. And then eventually that money makes its way to Colombia, uh, Peru and Bolivia and pays for the violence down there. Uh, last year, somebody drove a car bomb into this police academy in Bogota. I've spoken at this police academy, it's a beautiful facility. And that car bomb murdered 21 young police cadets, which is pictures of nine of those beautiful young kids. And it makes me very ashamed as an American that that bomb was paid for uh, by American drug users because it was a drug organization that killed those young officers. This is a recent seizure of cash um, in the Caribbean. You know, we can only imagine the violence and the corruption that $27 million in cash uh, can cause. And this is just a tiny fraction of the money that's leaving the United States to go to the hands of the drug traffickers. This is a seizure from San Diego from two weeks ago. and It makes me quite depressed. This is 114,000 fake fentanyl pills. We call these the blue death because they're causing so much of the overdose in the United States. And I'll talk a little bit more about these later. But even if the quality control in the Mexican laboratories were 99.9%, .9%, which is not that good, but even if it were that good, that still means there's over a hundred deadly pills in this picture. And then the traffickers will use any means to get the drugs across that border, even taping it to infants. All of this paid for by American drug users. And this is how I fight back. Uh, I go out in schools and I share my message. And uh, as Mr. Landau stated, you know, a lot of people uh, have a belief that it doesn't do any good. But in this case, I was talking to 2000 high school students and the teacher that took that picture told me he's never seen those students not on their phones. They were listening to me. And uh, I wish they were listening to me because I'm such a great speaker and because I'm so beautiful. But I think actually they're, they're listening to me because they're starved for information. Um, they see me as a DEA agent, as someone credible on this issue and they listen. And I happen to believe that if I can keep 2000 high school students listening and paying attention for an hour, and some of that information has to be getting into their heads. First time I went overseas, I took my presentation to Cartagena, Colombia, and I speak Spanish, but I wasn't worried about the Spanish, but I was worried if my message would translate. And I discovered that I didn't have to change anything because those kids in Cartagena are watching the same garbage uh, in the movies and the TV shows and on the internet that our kids are. They're getting the same messaging, the drug use is normal and everybody does it. It doesn't matter where I go. Um, the young people understand exactly what I'm talking about.
I have one of the best jobs on the planet to be able to go around and do this and meet these beautiful young kids. I look forward to much more work in Mexico. Um, I've had a success everywhere I've gone. And I'll, I'll share this picture with you. This next picture makes me very proud. We have a juvenile prison here in San Diego and there's a special group of young women who have all been convicted of murder or attempted murder before the age of 18. And this is a group of women that's considered lost and impossible to reach. Uh, and in fact, the day I volunteered to go give my presentation to them, uh, I was offered many chances to, to change my mind because the prediction was they wouldn't listen. I spoke for two hours. And when I was done, I said, are there any questions? And the first question was, when can you come back and talk to us some more? Because they got the point, they've lived it. And you're not allowed to take pictures at all but I was able to grab this picture. And I asked these young women convicted of murder if, that if they believe in my program, would they stand with their backs to the camera and show their support? So this picture makes me very, very proud because if I can reach these young women, I can reach pretty much anybody, I think. And I have to explain to the kids some very basic things. Their brains matter. Our society around the world is encouraging kids to use these very powerful psychoactive drugs during the teenage years and the early 20s. Well, a child's brain begins to grow aggressively at about 12, 13 years old. It doesn't stop to about 25. And if our youth are using these powerful psychoactive substances to change how their brains work, while their brains are also trying to grow, it doesn't take a big leap of imagination to understand that they're probably changing how their brains are growing. They don't understand that. And then I, I explained basically their choices matter. You, you don't get to ignore school or behave badly uh, or party. And then all of a sudden, when you're 25, you snap your fingers and be successful. If you want to be successful, you pick a goal and you make choices that are in alignment with your goal and you work towards it. It's, it's fairly basic. We all know this, right? But our kids aren't thinking about this enough. And, uh, you know, they listen. And then I share with them what I call my laws of substance abuse. And the first one, of course, is that it almost always starts as a choice. There is that rare case where somebody is forced to use drugs. But for the vast majority of people, they're at a party, they're at a friend's house, they're at the beach. Someone they know comes up with a drug and says, hey, look what I got, let's use this. And they put it in front of them and our kid has to make a choice. It starts as a choice. And I explained to the kids that people who keep making that choice change. I don't care what the drug is, if it's alcohol, marijuana, or the much harder drugs, sooner or later, every drug user changes and those aren't good changes. And then of course, the third law is perhaps the worst one that those negative changes that happen to the drug user never ever just affect the drug user. And I'll spend much of my presentation talking about those negative changes that impact us as a society. And to do that, I have to use very strong and powerful imaging to fight back against the messaging. Now the messaging that my kids have received and your kids have received since birth is that drug use is cool. Everyone does it, it's, it's just part of growing up. It's about your choices, do whatever you want. And I show these pictures to fight back against that. And these are real pictures from the state of Ohio from several years ago. The father and his girlfriend are driving around town and they're heroin users. So they use heroin in the car in front of the kid and keep driving around. And sadly, as too often happens, the woman injected too much heroin and began to die from a drug overdose. Her boyfriend who loved her dearly was racing to try to get her to the hospital to save her when he also began to enter into a drug overdose. He passed out at the wheel, that vehicle went out of control and stopped in the middle of the street, just like you see it. Now, a little four-year-old boy sitting in the back thinks his father's dead, thinks the girlfriend's dead. You can see the police officer's arm coming through the window, surrounded by strangers in the middle of a nightmare. And when these pictures first came out, you couldn't see his face because it was pixelated. So I dug deep in the internet because I really was curious to see what look of a reaction this little child had on his face. And sadly, I discovered he had none. That little boy has no reaction. And what that tells me is that this is not the first time he's seen this. This is his normal. And I personally think that's pretty severe emotional damage in a four-year-old child. That's not his fault. It, that's a consequence of his father's choices. Um, this young mother took her little girl shopping, probably for a fun outing, used drugs in the parking lot and went in and overdosed in the store. I find it quite sad to see that picture of a toddler tugging at her mommy, trying to get her off the floor. When I began in the DEA back in 1990, we were losing about 10,000 Americans a year to overdose death which seemed like a huge number to me, it still does. Uh, in 2007, when I began to give these presentations, I looked at the numbers and it had climbed to 35,000 a year. Uh, and that horrified me. I, I was convinced that the country wouldn't accept that. I was convinced that, naively convinced, 
that we would change what we're doing. Well, uh, it's 2020 and I'm still waiting for us to change what we're doing. Last year, it was 72,000 Americans who perished from drug overdose. The numbers are so big, uh, you know, I struggle to get my mind around them. So I, I looked at some other historical catastrophes and I looked at the four major wars of the 20th century, World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And in those 19 years of global warfare, we lost just over 600,000 soldiers killed. 19 years of brutal global warfare. But if you look at United States overdose death from this year going back 19 years, it's over 700,000 dead. Over 700,000 American men, women, and children dead from drugs not killed by some foreign enemy on a foreign battlefield, but rather killed by an enemy within us that makes us so willing to poison ourselves. And you know, we're not even beginning to understand what the COVID lockdowns have done to us. There are really strong indicators that overdose is way up, that child abuse is way up, suicide is up. And we're not even done. We're not even close to being done with lockdowns. Um, May of this year showed a 42% increase in overdoses compared to May of last year nationally. And the numbers last year were already massive. This video is pictures of people who died from overdoses. So as you watch this, I'm gonna ask you to look at their faces and their smiles and to think about how tragic each loss is. Welcome to America in 2020. One more light goes out in the 
once time runs out If a moment is all we are Or quicker, quicker Who cares if one more light goes out Well, I do Well, I Seventy-two thousand, at least, I think, I fear, at least seventy-two thousand more people, just as beautiful and unique as those you just saw, uh, will perish this year from drugs too. And I don't know when, I don't know when, as a society, we're going to react. I'll keep waiting. I'll talk today about a few of the different types of drugs that are causing the massive damage. Opioids have gotten a lot of attention. Certainly, a big problem between Mexico and the United States. And I love this expression: "You don't take them, they take you." And that's been my experience. I've worked with dozens, maybe hundreds of opioid addicts. And they start taking the drug because it helps them feel better, escape from life. And uh, sooner or later, they lose control and they give it all up to the opioids. And, you know, traditionally heroin was the, the dirty back alley street drug that uh, everyone understood was something you didn't want to use. And this is why. This is the young woman in San Diego who started using heroin to help her escape from her problems in life. And you see what it did to her after just five years. But now we've got a different problem. Heroin has been largely replaced uh, by this drug fentanyl. And fentanyl is what's causing most of the overdose death in the United States. And it's starting to increase overdose death around the world as well. And that small amount of fentanyl on that penny is enough to overdose me. And unbelievably, we're now seeing this drug carfentanil showing up in the fake pills that our kids are taking. And that microscopic white dot that's on that penny on the right is enough to overdose, overdose me. And I'm a 200 pound man. Now, carfentanil has a legitimate use, uh, and I'm not making this up. It's a, an elephant tranquilizer. If a zoo wants to do surgery on an elephant, they'll give it a little bit of carfentanil and the giant elephant goes to sleep. So what do you think is gonna happen to your child who takes a, a fake Xanax or a fake Vicodin at a party that has a little too much carfentanil in it? Um, these are horrible pictures. This is a young father and his young son in California. The father was a fentanyl user, uh, took too much and overdosed. And in that process, his young infant son got exposed to the fentanyl and overdosed as well at his side. But this is how it's coming across the border. Um, the United States has a huge appetite for abusing prescription drugs and the drug traffickers have taken advantage of that. And they realized they could make a lot more profit if they would counterfeit the prescription drugs. So over the last five or six years, we're seeing increasing quantities of these fake pharmaceutical pills coming in now primarily from Mexico. These are pills I seized at the border with Tijuana coming up from Mexico. Uh, and they're designed to fool the American drug user. They, they look pretty good now. The quality didn't used to be very good, but now it's quite good. And for me, this is probably the most important slide. If there's one message you can take away from this presentation, that the drug problem today is quite different than it used to be. Um, if, you remember, if you recall in the video, you saw the two 13-year-old boys who died. They ordered a drug, a, a synthetic opioid off the internet from China, they came to their house in Utah and they used it and died. First time they used it. Uh, but this is why these pills are so deadly. Most of what goes into a prescription pill is uh, that yellow substance called the binder. It's a sugar, it's nothing. It just holds the pill together. Uh, and if I'm in a pharmaceutical company, I know what I'm doing and I'm a scientist. I take that binder and I mix in the red, which is the, the chemical, the drug I want in there. And I blend it properly. And each pill that I stamp out from my machine has exactly the right amount of drug. That's how you know what you're getting as far as dosage. But if I'm making these pills in a drug lab in Mexico or a drug lab here in San Diego for sale, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a scientist and no one's regulating me. So I take my binder and I mix in my fentanyl or my carfentanil or my heroin or whatever I have, and I blend it. And I, I probably attempt to blend it properly, but I don't know what I'm doing. And when I make my pills, as you can see on the bottom of there, some of the pills have none of the drug, some have a range of it, and some have enough to kill a horse. And what's so terrifying to me as a DEA agent is, I've talked to these people, they can't tell which pills are deadly. All the pills look the same when they come out of the machine. They have no means to test them, so they sell them. And those pills get sold to someone else and sold to someone else. They get sold 10 times before they show up at the party with our kids. And of course, the person that shows up at the party goes, look what I got, I got these prescription drugs. These are good and safe, trust me. And people do, and they take these. And unfortunately, somebody takes that pill on the right and dies, just goes to sleep, never comes back. We live, we live in a world where the one pill can kill the first time you use drugs, it could be the last time. These are 
drugs we seized in San Diego. This is what it looked like. This is what we thought it was. And we had it analyzed by our DE laboratory. And this is what it turned out to be, not making this up. And the profits are massive. And this problem has been growing dramatically. And it's going to continue to grow dramatically. This problem is not going away. These are some recent seizures, those pills on the left. And uh, the pictures on the right are of a legitimate Vicodin. But do you think a drug user in a party who's been drinking alcohol or smoking marijuana can look at those pills and, and make a decision as which one's fake? Because I don't think so. This is from a lab here in San Diego. That's the pill press they use. On the top right, you see the green and blue bottles. That was the, the dye, the colorant that the man was using to fake the pills and then the bag of binder. And then of course, new opioids are being invented every day. Uh, really scary because the scientists are operating on the edge of, of chemistry. They're creating drugs that will get people high, but have never been used in humans. So we don't know the long-term or short-term consequences. And, and it's insane, but we have a drug using culture that's willing to use whatever is sold to them or offered to them. These are the laboratories. This is what they look like when we find them. There is no quality control. Breaking bad is a lie. It is not some PhD chemist making this stuff. It's people mixing dangerous chemicals together to make money. And nobody would eat food that came from a kitchen that's disgusting. And yet people will pay a lot of money to take the chemicals that come from these filthy places and put it in their bodies. That makes no sense. Um, very expensive to clean up, very toxic places. Frequently these labs explode, catch on fire. Um, fire department calls and tells us there was a drug lab there. And when we go, we go in spacesuits. That's how dangerous these chemicals are. And after we clean up the lab, they wash us off to make sure we get none of these chemicals on, on our skin. And it, yet people pay millions, billions of dollars a year in this country to deliberately put this stuff in their bodies. This is a real DEA meth lab raid. Um, welcome to my world. <laughs> So they're manufacturing the drugs in that home. That entire environment's completely toxic and contaminated. That's why we go in our spacesuits. Everyone living in that home is also contaminated with all the drug and all the chemicals, including that little toddler who's been absorbing all those chemicals into, into his skin. 
So the, the courts in the United States take those infants away, they're given the Child Protective Services and most often put in foster care to be raised by families that'll not endanger their lives. But all of this again is being paid for by the American drug users. Now, after 30 years in, in a bureaucracy, uh, certain things get frustrating and tiring, but this problem keeps me motivated because once in a while, if we do our job right, we get to punish the people responsible for this. Now, every year in the United States, we have hundreds of thousands of babies born addicted to things. Fetal alcohol syndrome babies, crack babies, meth babies, marijuana babies now. Uh, but th this particular problem really bothers me. It's the, it's the babies born addicted to the opioids that their mothers were taking throughout the pregnancy. Now, we estimate there's some 35,000 infants born in the United States every year addicted to the opioids their mothers were taking. Those young mothers know they're drugging their babies. The reason they keep using drugs while they're pregnant is they're afraid to stop. Because when you're using opioids and you're addicted, if you try to stop, you get the terrible withdrawal sickness. It makes you feel like you wanna die. So these mothers make a horrible bargain. They keep using the drugs and they get to pass the gift of withdrawal onto the baby. Because the day that infant is born and the doctors cut the umbilical cord, that child experiences withdrawal. It's not toddler-sized withdrawal or infant withdrawal, it's full-blown adult agony withdrawal. And their little bodies aren't capable of dealing with it and they twitch and they scream. 35,000 every year, this is not a new problem. And unbelievably, the doctors have come up with a, a way to try to mitigate that pain. And that's by giving these babies morphine on the day they're born. And that's what you see in this picture. This is not an American infant getting vitamins on the day he's born. It's an American infant getting morphine, trying to take away some of the pain that his mother gave him at birth. Now, students don't understand really what morphine is. So I show this picture. I, I work with the wounded warriors in San Diego and my young friend there with the metal legs was in Afghanistan when he was 19 years old and stepped on a landmine and it blew his legs clean off. And when he landed on the battlefield without his legs, literally cut in half, his fellow soldiers came and gave him morphine to help him. So just think about that for a moment. The same drug that we have to give this man so badly wounded on the battlefield, we have to give to more than 35,000 newborn babies in this country every year. And we don't talk about this problem. And I happen to believe if we're not talking about it, we're not really trying to solve it. A crying baby is always unsettling. And it's even worse when you know the baby, like this little girl, just days old, is in pain. Her jittery shakes and her shrill cry are very distinctive. And they last for days. Doctors know exactly what's to blame. Heroin. Heroin, heroin. And our children, and well, all of us live in scary times. Uh, this is a video that came out a few years ago. Some young women, college students on spring, on spring break somewhere, drinking and being stupid, not looking for trouble, filming themselves. And later that day, they watched the video and they saw this. And that is a man in the middle of the day in front of hundreds of people drugging their drink, probably with the intent to cause them serious harm. And thank goodness uh, nothing happened to those young ladies that day. But as a father of daughters, um, I, I take it upon myself to make sure the kids understand in today's world, there are many, many predators like this out there and the substances that can do this are, are widely available through the internet. So it's a sad reality, but you can't go anywhere to a party, to a barbecue, to the beach and not be worried about where you're going, not be worried about with whom you're going and, and not have a plan to look out for each other because we're not gonna be there to protect them. Our kids have to make plans to protect themselves. So something terrible like this doesn't happen to them. And the smartphones, I'm addicted to mine too. I'm not a big fan. I've seen how they've impacted my kids. Um, I'm seeing how they're creating a lot of uh, isolation and social anxiety, which are big drivers behind drug use. And uh, we're not coming to terms with our drug problem. And I certainly don't think we're coming to terms with how the smartphone is contributing to uh, the drug abuse problem. And it's all about the money. It's all about the money. As long as there's a market for the drugs here in the United States, someone will be selling the drugs. So these are pictures of some of the investigations I've done just to show you how creative the drug traffickers are. This woman was getting on a plane in Bolivia uh, with a ticket for Spain. And as she was coming through security, one of the female police officers touched her big hair and felt that kilo of cocaine in there. And that may look ridiculous, but I interviewed that woman that day and she confessed to me that she'd made four trips successfully. I used to see this on the border with Tijuana here in San Diego. The traffickers would find a young woman who could cross the border and they'd pay her to put that on. They'd fill the belly with drugs and they'd dress her very nicely and send her across the border. And 20, 30 years ago, border inspectors weren't comfortable touching the belly of a pregnant woman. 
This is an investigation of mine from some years ago. The border fence between Mexico and the United States in this part of San Diego was only about three feet tall. And the drug traffickers had built these ramps and they would load these suburbans full of drugs in Mexico. And then they would go to Los Angeles and they would recruit white kids and black kids uh, who were begging runaways, looking for a little bit of money. And they'd offer them thousands of dollars to drive these vehicles over the fence and to try to get them into San Diego. And these kids would offer themselves up willingly to go, willingly to go work for the drug cartels down in Mexico. And these are sad pictures. These are our x-rays of a young man who died. Um, this young man in South America was desperate to get a chance to live in Europe uh, or the United States where he could have more economic opportunity. And the drug traffickers know this and they took advantage of him. They made him an offer he couldn't refuse. They offered him a plane ticket and a passport and a few hundred dollars in exchange for swallowing these packages of cocaine, which he gladly did. Sadly for him on the flight, one of the packages burst open and he died suddenly of a cocaine overdose. Uh, these x-rays were taken when he arrived in Europe. And this is a case that I dealt with in Bolivia. I was at the airport again, and a young 19 year old was coming through security also with a ticket for Spain, but he was doubled over and clutching himself in obvious pain. And I touched his stomach and it felt like a board that I was hitting, it was that hard. So we rushed into the hospital and convinced the doctors to, to operate on him to save his life because the packages had gotten all blocked up inside him. And I watched as they pulled out 96 packages of cocaine the size of my thumb that that young man had swallowed. And that's, that's not for human beings, but there it is. Um, and this is all paid for, it's barbaric and it's all paid for by the drug users. And now we have this problem in San Diego. The drug traffickers are approaching teenagers who live in Mexico and come across the border to go to school in San Diego. And their classmates who work for the drug traffickers recruit these kids who need money. They find students whose parents can't pay the rent or have medical bills or something. And they tell them, look, I'll give you $500, easy. All you have to do is take some drugs in your body and bring it across the border. And now we have high school kids bringing these drugs to their high school campuses being recruited by their classmates. And these are not small quantities of drugs. These are massive quantities of drugs. And I want our high schools to be safe places of learning. I do not want our high schools to be places where major drug transactions are happening and our kids are being recruited by the drug cartels. Um, Mexican methamphetamine is, is definitely one of the biggest problems we're facing. Um, in San Diego, it seems like a tidal wave of this this meth just rolling across the border with no end in sight. And of course, it transits San Diego and now is spreading out across the United States. Um, production is, is unbelievable in Mexico. I don't believe anybody knows actually how much is being produced. Um, all the recent seizures continue to break records on uh, the size of the laboratories and the quantity that's being produced. Um, there's been some super lab seizures in Mexico where they found more than 20 tons of the drug. But this is what it does to the individual. Um, these are pictures of real methamphetamine users. Um, these are pictures before they started using, taken when they were arrested for something, they got out of jail. And then a short while later, they were rearrested after using meth and three months and 11 months. You look at the destruction that this drug does to them. People take this drug to feel powerful and strong, but over time it, it decays in them like this and they keep using it because they're addicted. They can't stop. These people look like, you know, normal, relatively normal people. They're all somebody's child, somebody's brother, sister, husband, wife, parent. Um, but you can tell from these pictures that once they hand over control to the methamphetamine, they don't care about anything. They'll do whatever it takes to get more meth into their bodies. And that woman on the left looks like she's already got a few problems, but look at this change. It says three years, five months. And to me, it looks like it was, must have been 35 years of very hard living that woman went through. I don't know this woman, but I've met many people like her and I promise you something. That woman saw herself in the mirror as she did this to herself. And I, I would speculate that many hundreds or thousands of times she told herself that she was gonna stop, that she wasn't gonna do it anymore. And she meant it each time she told herself that. But soon after her own brain said, oh no, no, do what you have to do, sell your body, sell drugs, steal something to get more drug to give it to me. And these people hand themselves over willingly to the slavery of this drug addiction that ends up destroying them. These are pictures of some of the seizures. This is how it's coming across the border. Massive, massive seizures. These are all hundreds of thousands of doses of this toxic poison. Huge challenge for US law enforcement to try to stop this. This guy was bringing it across in the spare tires. We watched him bring a spare tire into his house and we arrested him. When I opened his garage, I found all these others uh, from the loads that we didn't catch. 
And then uh, I'll finish with my drug discussion with marijuana and vaping. And of course, in California, the state has legalized it, which has created a very complicated situation. And we also have an enormous problem with vaping, which is the, the electronic cigarettes, which is now spread down into our 11 and 12 year olds. Uh, it's become almost an epidemic among our sixth and seventh graders. Now, kids don't understand this. Um, this is what smoking does to your lungs. We saw these pictures when we were growing up. Our society thought we needed to teach kids about this. And it, it worked, really, because young people today in the United States don't want cigarettes. We have successfully taught them that cigarettes are nasty and dangerous. So kids don't want them because they, they understand it does this to their lungs. Now, the tobacco companies have a problem with that because the business model of the tobacco companies is to get their product into the young people, get them addicted young, and then those addicted people will buy that product for the rest of their life, regardless of what it does to them. So as the younger generation in the United States turned away from cigarettes and the companies were losing profits, they had to find a replacement. So they turned to the wonders of the electronic cigarette, which is the same nicotine, just in a pure form. And when they first make these devices, they made them, they were clunky and large, but eventually, uh, they made them very discreet and sneaky, like that one in the middle, but looks like a USB drive. That was from the Juul company. And the Juul company brags that each one of those devices has as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. That's a lot of nicotine in that device that doesn't look dangerous. And of course, these people are liars. Uh, they have argued many, many times. They never marketed these devices for young people. But look at that advertisement and ask yourself, who is that directed for? Is that directed for an adult cigarette smoker who needs to get away from cigarette smoking or is that directed at our 12 and 13 year olds to get them to think this product is attractive? And it worked. Use of these things has spread like wildfire among our young kids. The kids listen to the name vaping. That sounds harmless, water vapor. How dangerous could it be? It's not water vapor. It's an aerosol of oils and toxic chemicals that goes into the lung and stays there. These are x-rays of a man in San Diego Oh no, the x-ray on the left is of a normal person who's not a vapor. And the x-ray on the right is of a man here in San Diego who almost died just from nicotine vaping because that aerosol coated the insides of his lungs and he wasn't able to get oxygen anymore. And he did survive after many months in the hospital. And I, to, to, to get kids to understand the nicotine that's in the vape, just because it's flavored like bubble gum, doesn't mean it's not addictive or dangerous. And you know, I explained to them, this man had cancer from his smoking. And even after having cancer surgery to save him, he continues to smoke. That's how powerful the addiction is. And I have to explain to the kids, if you vape, eventually you'll become as addicted or even more addicted than this man. My daughters tell me they have friends who vape in bed. They take the vape, vape device to bed, they wake up during the night, they suck on it and they go back to sleep. They take it to school and use it at school. You can't smoke in bed, you can't smoke at school, but you can vape. And I explained to the kids that nicotine uh, even though it's legal, is not a nice chemical. For hundreds of years, it was used as a, an insecticide, you know, in the, before the modern pesticides. This is what people would use. So I asked the kids to think about how truly cool is it to be sucking on a vaporized insecticide that can get you addicted. And these are some of the commercial poisons that were made just from nicotine. You know, ju again, just because something is safe and can be bought and put in your body does not mean it's intelligent to do so. And then marijuana. And the, the two big problems with marijuana are the whole legalization movement, the normalization of using it, and the massive increase in potency. Now, when I was in high school 35 years ago, my friends smoked marijuana, but it was about four to five percent potent. And my friends got plenty stoned smoking those marijuana joints. But over those intervening 25, 30 years now, the drug traffickers have heavily modified the plant. And the marijuana plant in California now produces 20% or more potency. So smoking a joint today just smoking the plant in the joint is like smoking four or five joints was 30 years ago. And many adults who support marijuana use don't understand that. Our kids are smoking a very different form of the drug. And then of course, if you go to the concentrated forms of THC, the drug in marijuana, which are also legal, um, they call it wax, shatter, honey oil, these very concentrated forms, the potency can be 50, 60, 80, even 90%. And the kids are smoking this and they have no idea how much THC is going into their bodies. And we as a society have no idea the damage that THC is causing to them. I'm not happy with American psychology and psychiatry professions because in their book, the DSM-5, they list cannabis as an addictive substance. They call it cannabis use disorder, just like they call it cocaine use disorder or alcohol use disorder. 
they list cannabis, marijuana, THC, as an addictive drug. And yet they're not out publicly telling our kids this. They're mostly silent. And so our kids are listening to their idols in sports and, the, and TV and the movies telling them that drug use is normal and everyone smokes it and there's no harm, no consequence to it. But studies now are saying different things. We have huge populations of young people who smoked a lot of marijuana uh, in their teenage years. And they're finding, often finding these links between marijuana use and mental illness and changes in the developing brain. This is from the American Psychological Association magazine, Marijuana and the Developing Brain. They're not finding these changes in adults so much, which makes sense because an adult brain is, is, is done growing. Scientific American, the very legitimate scientific journals are discussing the damage to our kids. And yet as a society, we're not sharing that information with our kids. A study at Harvard uh, found a dramatic correlation be between damage to marijuana smoking and damage to the amygdala in marijuana smokers. And I tell the kids you know, who've used marijuana or who've been told 10,000 times that marijuana is safe, it's okay they don't believe me. I, they think I'm making it up, educate themselves. I tell them to do this Google search. Google teen brain damage marijuana and read some of the scientific articles. And it's hilarious because kids in my presentation will get out their phones and Google that and start doing this, this, this reading in my presentations, which I'm happy with because I want them to be able to make informed choices. I want them to understand the damage they're doing to themselves. And then of course they produce the THC in these really concentrated form look like candy. And this has one purpose and that's to make this drug attractive to very young children. And at the end of my presentations, I use some very simple imaging. I ask the students if they're at school and, and they open lunch and it looked like this, would they eat it? And the kids all groan and say, well, of course they wouldn't eat it. And I say, right, because at two years old, we all figured out you don't eat this. At two years old, we all figured this out. You could put that thing in front of a hungry two-year-old girl and she's gonna go, ooh, icky, no thank you, I don't want it, right? But how can it be that a two-year-old wouldn't put something dangerous like that in their body, and yet a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old would go to the party, and someone walks in with a, a drug that could literally kill them or take control of their life, and instead of going, ooh, icky, they're like, okay, right on, now it's my chance. They don't think about those choices. So that's my goal of leaving powerful messaging in there that percolates, and maybe the next time someone offers them drugs, or maybe in six months, or maybe in a year, some part of what I've shared will resonate, and they'll back away from using something. In this park in Connecticut, just about two years ago, uh, a man walked in with a bag and started handing out these hand rolled cigarettes that looked like marijuana joints. And he handed them up for free and he told people, the kids, these were spice cigarettes. And 110 kids smoked those things and overdosed and went to the hospital. And that story shocks me because those 110 kids would not have taken food from that man. If he'd walked through that park with 110 hot dogs and handed them out, very few of those kids would have eaten those things. They would have thrown them away because we all understand it's best not to take food from strangers. But this total stranger walks in with a drug and 110 kids put it in their body and almost kill themselves. And that tells me we have a huge problem in our culture and we need to fight back. I need your help. I need your help fighting back. And I finished my presentations with this message. I believe in the kids. I do this work because I believe in them. I believe in their potential. I believe in their ability to accomplish their dreams. But I also tell them it doesn't really matter what I think, it matters what they think. It matters what decisions they're gonna make in those tough spots. And I believe that if they start respecting themselves today and they start thinking about where they wanna go in life, it'll be much easier for them not to make those wrong choices. And then my last slide um, is one of a picture my youngest daughter drew of me. I went to her school one day uh, to talk to the kids and I came home and my little girl was about eight and she drew this picture of me. And it's a treasure for me because my little girl looked at me as a hero. She's not the best artist, but she looked at me as a hero and wanted me to know it. That note I took from the wall of a man I arrested here in San Diego a few years ago. He was addicted to the pill Vicodin, taking 50 Vicodin a day. And when I arrested him and had him in handcuffs in the office, I searched his wall and I found this piece of paper and I asked him what it was. And he said, it's a note from his six-year-old son. And I got angry at him. I got angry. The note says, dear dad, drugs are for babies. How much pain does a six-year-old child have to be in to write that note to his own father? Because what that note really says to me is, dear dad, stop ruining my life. Dear dad, stop hurting me. So I started yelling at this guy. It stopped being Agent Heron and the prisoner. It was dad to dad. And he started crying. And he admitted to me that he knew how much pain he's causing his son. He admitted to me he wanted to stop. He admitted to me he carried that note with him every day because he wanted to stop. And he admitted to me that every time he tried to stop, his own brain said, oh, no, no, give me my drug. So I asked the students, you know, what kind of a future do you choose? 
Do you want a future where you make choices that take you to a place where you bring strength and love and joy to your families and your communities and you live full lives? Or are you willing to make choices that might take you to a place in the future where you bring pain and misery and suffering to your own families? And I tell them that choice is theirs. And that's my presentation. Um, it's been, again, really an amazing opportunity to, to get the chance to share this with you, to have the support of Ambassador Landau. Uh, there's my email. I'm quite serious. I'd love to hear from you if you liked it or didn't like it. Uh, if you have thoughts, if you're, if you're interested in a virtual presentation for some student group or community group, email me. Um, we'll see if we can, if there's a way to make it happen. And then I've also recently created an online uh, social media presence and just getting started. But if you want to support my social media on Instagram, uh, help me get this message out, help me share this message. It's uh, at I define my future. So with that, I will sign off and thank you again very, very much for, for listening to me.